Hi hey everybody, welcome back to VMware Explore 2024. My name is Dave Vellante and you're watching theCUBE's continuous coverage. This is day three. We're here at the Venetian, the, the VMware Explore floor, it's still going. It's definitely quieter than it has been in previous years, by design, by the way. I think VMware, uh, VMworld at its peak was probably around, let's call it 25,000. My guess, maybe 5,000 here today uh, and this week, all through the week. Pretty packed yesterday for Hawk Tan's keynotes, and with me, going deep with Sarbjeet Jahal, who's the principal analyst at StackPain and a member of the Cube Collective. Sarbjeet, you're always out there getting the scoop, you know, calling, calling balls and strikes, as John <laughs> likes to say, telling the truth. Uh, this has been one of the more interesting uh, VMware Explorers slash VMworlds that I've been to, and I've been probably, including COVID, maybe, I don't know, 17 of them. Yeah. Um, what's your take on the overall show, the vibe of the show, what do you make of it? The vibe of the show, actually, as you said, it's, uh, it's trimmed down. The, the keynote was good because it was sort of packed and there was 4,200, we yeah. were told. Um, people attended the keynote. So the, the show floor on, the, on this side, um, that, that's very... Uh, the partner exhibits, yeah. It looks very weak as compared to last year even, right? We have seen much bigger um, VMware Explodes and VMware World. Um, so that's, um, that's there. And, and people are sh sh showing their sort of the feelings or concerns. The vendors are, I, I, spoke, I spoke to a few of them, that how is the foot traffic and all that. It's, it's low. So yeah, it's trimmed down. And um, it's like wait and watch kind of like a situation for many partners, many customers and, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, vendors so, as well, which work with So let's get into, so yeah, I want to get your take on, on Hawk Tan's keynote, and you were also with, with me and others in the, in the analyst session, uh, where he was um, very candid. I mean, Hawk, Hawk Tan wasn't lying. He was telling you what was going on. He wasn't, there was no BS in his, in his conversation. He might have taken some liberties with some data in his keynote, but I mean, essentially he said, we are serious business people. You are too. We're here to help you run your business better. We don't chase shiny objects. We've been talking about how he kind of said to the previous management, they love shiny objects, including the cloud. We're all about private cloud. Uh, and then he brought up the Barclays CIO survey saying eight out of 10 CIOs are moving back on-prem. Um, you and I had a conversation about, well, that's sort of taking liberties with some of that <laughs> data, isn't it? Yeah, he took some liberties with, the, with the, the figures and how you say, like, even the, what, Proverbs you use, it can change the whole meaning. So the survey says that eight out of 83% of the CIOs want to move their workloads. Some workloads. Yeah, some workloads. Yeah. They're not moving. So he said they're moving. So that's a huge difference. Moving means they are doing it. Want to move means like they, they may, they plan, they, they're contemplating those things. So that, that's one, and then as you said, rightly so in previous segments that calling it AWS on-prem is a kind of a stretch. I believe so. But that's the, that's the, that is the north star, and that's that's their marketing line. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I guess I would say this, Sarbjeet, and I wonder if you agree. Is if you think about what we used to call true private cloud, true private cloud was always uh, the operating model is substantially similar to that of the hyperscales, um, and it, it the industry never got there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Let's we, double click we, on that. We published that. I think it, David Floyer put it out in like 2010, all right? And the industry has taken you know, 15 years and it's still not quite there. The cloud's moving too fast. But I will say this, the experience has changed dramatically on-prem. I mean, they, they finally kind of got, the, the on-prem guys got their act together in a, in a much bigger way because the cloud guys showed them how to do it with infrastructure as code and simpler deployment and management. But the cloud moves so fast it's like they can't catch up, but do they have to? So double click on that, what's your take on that statement, that North Star? Yeah, I think pri private cloud term is kind of, can be used in a mis misleading way. You can get private cloud with hyperscalers. Those are your, you know, dedicated, that, that's your um, gear, your storage. You, so it's not shared infrastructure. You can get that with them as well. So it's not like you can do private cloud only on-prem. 
which is implied in many of the talks. That's, that's number one. Number By fencing two, off and paying up for yes. that, that virtual private cloud. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, and, and a lot of customers do yeah, that. Yeah. The second thing is, what's the premise of cloud, actually public cloud in this case? When we say cloud, it's public, you know. No, yeah, yeah. That, right? yeah. It's implied, right? So, the premise is that you are not putting the CapEx, you are just using the OpEx, and you can do a lot more experimentation uh, faster, you know, you don't have to wait for servers to come in, you're not racking and stacking those servers. Putting VMware software on top of servers, you still need servers, right, if you are doing on-prem implementation of private cloud. So that's the messiest part. Even if you imagine that you can get those servers um, in a pricing model which mimics cloud, you know, so you pay per use from Dell's of the world or HPE's of the world, then in that case, VMware has to work with those vendors and they are also working with other software shops like Red Hat and like Nutanix. So I think this new, I call it new VMware, it's a new VMware actually, I see that as a totally new model, the, the new narrative, uh, new VMware is, 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 has picked more competition, whereas they have, they are shedding some customers and some partners at the, at the same time. So they're, they're shrinking on one side and picking, com picking the um, competition on the other. Having said that, there, there are some pluses. Uh, uh, margins will be better. Um, total sales might go down or the they may stagnate, but the margins will be better going forward because the focus is um, on the margin right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and also at this mar market segmentation, like talk is very important as well, I think. The interesting thing in the analysts uh, session, so it was Q&A with analysts, but before Hawk went to Q&A, he told us a story. And basically said, look, at Broadcom we spend 1% of revenue on IT, and he's, you know, Many companies spend five, 10, even more percent of revenue on IT, and his implication was, he actually even said it, hey, he applied it, they just, they're wasting money. Um, he talked about how Broadcom affects a homogeneous environment, which is quite interesting. I, I, I've been back and forth with customers many times on this argument. A lot of times customers don't like to go to a homogeneous environment because they're afraid of lock-in, but his point was that by having a homogeneous environment, you can um, much better control your costs. And he gave the example of VMware was predominantly an SAP shop, Broadcom was predominantly an Oracle shop, mm -hmm. so they basically killed uh, uh, SAP at VMware, and they said, we're moving them to Oracle. Is Oracle any better than SAP? He goes, eh, not really. <laughs> but his point was that homogeneous environment was, allowed them to keep their costs down the second thing he emphasized is that essentially people are wasting money. So his message is to his customers and to the world, you should be more like Broadcom and be more efficient and stop wasting money on IT. And then the third point he said is, prior to moving to VCF, which saved them 50% relative to their other costs, um, traditional costs, they put out an RFP to the cloud guys and they came in anywhere from two and a half to four times more expensive, and he said, I get it, they got to make their margin. So all of that translates into, well, if you're Broadcom, you know, you're going to probably save money if you can be more efficient. Most customers aren't. So, where does that leave um, the customers, the ecosystem, and the industry, you know, given all that data that he threw at us? Yeah, I've seen a lot. Um, my team did data center audits for more than 120 data centers spanning more than a million servers from EMC. I'm ex-VMware, ex-Oracle, ex-EMC, so I have seen a lot out there. The, it, it's, some things are very easy to say. I can pick one company's example. I can, I can show you a company which spends half percent on, on their IT, right? But is that company doing great? What, what are they doing? What is, what's their business, right? So, not everybody, as you said, is not everybody is Broadcom. Broadcom is mainly a, a hardware company trying to do software. <laughs> that those things are different. 
And, and an engineering firm. And yeah, right? they, they have with, good engineering With very jobs. low go-to-market overhead. Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. And, and that, that's very capital intensive business and, and the, the ent new entrants are hard to find there. Whereas in software, there's a new entrant every, you know, every week. Look at uh, OpenAI, all of a sudden they dropped that stuff and the whole world is shaken by it. A lot of vendors are like, okay, what should we do now? Everybody's trying to do Gen AI. So software changes much faster. That was one of my, one of my questions to Chris Wall yesterday. It does, I said, uh, I know Broadcom has acquired software companies in the past, but I also understand that those software companies are not same kind of software companies like what VMware is, so. No company, no software company <laughs> is, is like right? VMware. They're yes, like yeah. the most unique, right? Most mm -hmm. unique, a very engineering focused culture, not, not sales driven or good marketing jobs. Um, so good engineering. Uh, yeah, good engineering, very good engineering yeah. actually, yeah. They have an engineering focused company. So it's just um, understanding software, who you are serving, developer proximity, it's, it's different. You have to be in constant touch with the market and I have seen this after, I can understand before the, the deal closed, I can understand that the execs were like zipped up, and kind of, oh, you can't talk about this or you can't talk about that. But after the deal was closed, still no, almost no communication came out of VMware side from Broadcom. I think that's a mistake and they need to correct that. You have to be constantly communicating with the market because customers and partners want to know the roadmaps and based on that they will plan what they want to do. So you have to be you have to be telling the story ahead, you know, narrative has to lead the product and that's the Yeah, that's I mean the customers point. you just go to the Reddit threads. I mean they, they sh <laughs> customers are angry. Um, you know, the the price increases which by the way VMware claims they're not increasing prices. You heard Hawk say the price per core is comparable or less. Uh, I think there is something to be said. If you go from uh, where you are today to, to VCF, you can affect some consolidation. If you go all in on VCF and have that homogeneous environment, that's his message. I don't doubt that you can save some money. I think the reality is, is that most customers aren't all in on VCF today. Um, one of the things they did, I got this, I, I, I probably just missed it in the pre-briefs, but you may know this. In 5.2, in VCF 5.2, they uh, have enabled a, a transparent or simplified migration from vSphere. So previously, if you were a vSphere customer and you wanted to go to VCF, yeah. it was a rip and replace. Now it's a, it's a non-disruptive mi migration, a non-disruptive non movement, which if they didn't do, but that's an example of Hawk Tan saying, look, Forget these shiny new toys. You got to plug that hole. I mean, he's a smart guy. I mean, he, I was really impressed with his command for the business, but in his tech, in the technology. But he said, I presume, you've got to plug that hole because in order for us to move customers, if they have to go through a rip and replace migration, they're going to look elsewhere. But make it so that they don't make it frictionless, so they don't have to look elsewhere. So that was, to your point, an interesting engineering task priority and was probably one of the top priorities that they had to affect pretty quickly, yeah. uh, I guess. And maybe that started before the actual close. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the com VMware is a, a unique uh, kind of company actually. There are a few others like which are, co where, where the companies where the community m sort of makes the shots, like the community demands a lot of stuff, right? There's a community which is, it has different persona, practitioners, right? And there's customers, there's partners, and and then there's vendor, right, itself. Like, so I think community. Um, repeat your question again. Once, sorry. Say your question again. I lost the question. So the pricing. You were talking yeah, about pricing. Yes, I was. I was and asking. Oh yeah, how quickly? How quickly they yeah. made the change? The, how quickly they made the the upgrade? You know in place versus like rip and replace. Yeah, and that engineering move to make yeah. these, the vSphere to vCF migration um, frictionless. Yeah, so so Hawk Tan, what he did did is that he, he spoke to a bunch of customers, 
I'm told that he sits in most of the, the sales meetings as well, and the customer meetings as well, of course sales as well. But he listens to the customer base very closely and then they say, we need to do these things. And he said, Let, let's do those things first. And by the way, those things have been demanded for the last five to seven years. Yeah, everybody's and been complaining about the lack of integration. I mean, you were at EMC, yeah. yes, you heard exactly. it there. Yeah. You certainly were, you guys owned VMware, you know, and, but it was just, let's keep bringing on, he's right, these new shiny new toys, and then never integrate them. Yes, exactly, so there was some people who came to VMware to polish their resumes, or some people were just parking there, I hate to say that, and those people are gone now. There's a lot of cleanup uh, have been done uh, on, the, on the management side, on the product side and on the pricing side. I think on the pricing side they did this little rushy rushy way. They should have taken a staged approach, I believe. Um, because when you're going at 90 miles an hour and you make 90 degree turn and you're going to flip over, so there will be some damage. Yes and no, I mean, I don't know if you know, remember the, the name Al Shugart. Al Shugart was at Icon in Silicon Valley. He invented the floppy disk drive, ran Shugart Associates, ran, and then built Seagate. And he used to tell me, you want to make a change, just rip the Band-Aid off and do it. So <laughs> that's kind of Hawk's approach. I want to ask you about Tanzu. Um, I mean, some of the gaps that you see in the, in the story relative to where AWS on-prem, AWS has a fantastic developer community, as does Microsoft and Google as well. Um, that's something that has been lacking at VMware, even though they've got you know, Pivotal and they've been making a run at that. It's, it's much more cogent with Tanzu than it ever has been. Uh, they've simplified, obviously, the SKUs. We hear 8,000 down to four. They've taken ARIA, put that into VCF. But you've got Tanzu now. That is their <coughs> developer strategy, their container strategy. It's critical that they get that attach rate into VCF, as John Furrier has pointed out many times. And then the other is the data strategy. We've been hitting that all week. But I want to ask you, with your developer chops, about Tanzu, how do you see VMware's posture in the developer community? What do they need to do to succeed there? I think they need to have this so whole SDLC covered, the DevOps side of things, the containers, right? Kubernetes have to be like frictionless there. The consumption of the uh, Kubernetes stack, if you will, that has to be made more developer friendly and API driven. They're not there yet. so. I actually think in terms of two sort of economics segments. There's the economics of systems creation, we have talked to many times. You create systems and you operate systems. When it comes to the, the economics of creation of systems, I think public cloud wins hands down. But when it comes to the systems economics of sort of system operation, then VMware, likes of Dell, likes of HP, has shot at that. But they're not telling the story that way. They, they are actually, they want to serve both creation and operation, and in, by doing that, they are missing the operation part. So they should clearly say that, we will save you, you know, a lot on the operation side, when, when it comes to creation, you know, public cloud is unbeatable, because the, the, the innovation, the, the IDE, IDE integrations, developers, have their preferred IDEs, their preferred libraries, libs, um, their preferred open source uh, sort of distros, so which cloud providers can provide you at a faster pace, and then they are very nimble. We have a session uh, later on today with uh, Drew Nielsen, and we are going to go deep into the TCO. We touched on it earlier in our first segment, but yes, we're going to go deep, 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 and we've got some graphics on here, they've done a lot of modeling, you know, they get, you know, you know, when you work at a vendor, you got to have like legitimate TCO to show customers. Exactly. Um, that's something that the, the technology community has done very well uh, for the past you know, 10 years. They used to not be so good at it, but they're very good at it now. Go ahead, please. Another point I want to make is that, that what most of the industry pundits and most of um, the analysis don't cover is the distinction between the, what is the ISV developer versus I, what is the on, um, prem enterprise developer. Enterprise developers develop software for the enterprise itself. They don't sell software. Right. So ISVs are of a different nature. They scale. Yeah. Yes, 
And we most of the time tend to broad stroke, you know, oh, developer focus, you know, like which developer, what are we talking about, ISVs? non-ISVs, um, sort of uh, enterprise, which enterprise? Because the top tier of the enterprise uh, customers, they act like ISVs. They have a lot more development in-house. They Big have banks, a lot more job. Yes, exactly. Right, I mean, leading companies, the Tesla of yeah, the Tesla's world. Tesla's of the world, right, yeah. the Bank of, Bank of America yeah. of the world, and, and, and PMC, Capital, yeah, you know, Capital One. Capital right. One is like known as yes. like very aggressive on the tech side. So you got to distinguish between these. I think for VMware, the, the upper, from the upper sort of customer base, um, that's tough for that's them. That's tough for them. Yeah. So in the middle, they will do great actually. I think they're, they're shooting for that. I asked that question uh, yesterday, and uh, the question, the answer was kind of winged, but, but we know what the story is. Real quick, uh, you put out a tweet of all the earnings that are coming tonight, I believe. Oh, yeah. NVIDIA, Salesforce, CrowdStrike, a, uh, HP, that's HPQ. NetApp, um, Pure Storage. Uh, Viva Systems, NetApp, Pure Storage, Okta, <laughs> and Nutanix. It's crazy, That's just it's crazy today. It's going to be insane tonight. Yes. Um, NVIDIA announces at 120, I think, uh, Pacific. Yeah. So that'll be after the close. And in Salesforce, it'll be interesting to see what they do. CrowdStrike, you know, we've I've put out there that I think they're going to you know, reset their expectations, obviously bring the ARR way down. I, know, I think George Kurtz will be prudent on that. Um, and the others, it's going to be really interesting to see. Actually, relevant to this show, it'll be interesting to see What's happening with Nutanix? See what kind of uptick they're getting. But I'll give you the last word on, uh, on the earnings. What are you yeah. expecting? I, I think my expectations are that NVIDIA will beat, but how big the beat is, that will set the, like what happens, does it go 7, 8% up, or 7, 8% down, or you know, the people yeah. are saying 10% swing this way or that way. But that's one, and then the, also the guidance, based, based upon, they had the production hiccup, so how big that hiccup was, they have clarified some of that um, in recent With past. Blackwell, you mean? Huh? With Blackwell. With Blackwell, mean, yeah. yeah. They had some issues in production, and they rectified those issues pretty quickly. Um, but with uh, CrowdStrike, I, I, as you said, they, they are resetting expectations. And they, I think the, in, during the conference call, the analysts will, analysts will ask about how many people have sued you, and, and are you, how you're planning to uh, counter that. And I, to be honest with you, I, my gut feel is this: that, that yes, there, there was a big, that was a big hiccup, but the people didn't lose much data. They lost some business for like a day or two, or they, they were grappling with it. But it was not like people will forget that. I think we'll for see the, for the most part. I, I hope so because uh, I think CrowdStrike's an good, amazing they company have, they have good with great leadership, jobs. and they're honest people, and 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 and. Uh, it's going to be interesting, uh, CrowdStrike Falcon is coming up. I just gave a quote to Silicon Angle as to what to expect. They're very clearly going to address that and talk about <clears throat> you know, new processes. But I think they, they've got no choice than, than to take the ARR down. Their quarter obviously is going to be affected by this. So Arbjeet, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Always a thanks, pleasure. Thanks Dave, always. Great always to fun. see you. Thank you. All right, keep it right there. We'll be back with our next segment at VMware Explore 2024. My name is Dave Vellante. Rob Strecci is also here. You're watching theCUBE.